Hey, hello. Uh, okay, can people hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is philosophy 125, philosophy of science, and I think uh, I know actually almost everyone in the class has had a course with me although not everyone. Um, but anyway, so I'm Abe Stone. You can call me Abe. You can call me Professor Stone. I'm perfectly fine with either one. Um, and um, before I say anything else, there was someone who wanted to make an announcement for CalPERG. Are, are you here, Joseph Schindler? Uh, one second, participants. I guess he's not here yet. Well, if he appears, we'll, um, we'll make an announcement. Um, So, sorry, I'm a little bit out of practice here. I need to figure out how to mute everyone because there's some noise. I don't remember how to do it. I don't have a microphone there now. I don't know. Okay, hopefully it won't be a problem. <laughs> um, Everyone, please mute yourselves unless you want to ask a question, in which case you should unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can ask. So someone said, I think everyone is muted right now. But no, I, I hear I hear some noise coming through, so not everyone is muted. Um, yeah, so anyway, if you want to ask something, you can either ask in the chat, which I will try to keep an eye on, or you can unmute yourself and ask out loud. Um, so, uh, today, you know, since there was no reading for today, I'm not going to go the whole time. I'm just going to, uh, go through the syllabus and say some introductory stuff about the course. Um, Okay, actually, I think if I just go through the syllabus, everything that I need to talk about will be on there. So let me share the screen. Um, the browser. Okay, so, um, this is my main courses page. This is the URL, people.ucsc.edu tilde abestone slash courses. Can't read the rest of this here, but it's here. Um, and you'll see at the top is this course. And so you can find the syllable this way, syllabus this way.
I don't know why that happened. Anyway, so here's the syllabus. And OK, right. So the if you need to reach me, the best way to reach me is to send an email. I'm going to try to always check that at least a couple times a day. I used to be worse at doing that. And if that should flare up, Again, I have this thing. I'm not really sure it still works, though. It's called Notify Aid, where you can send a push notification to my phone. Um, so I would try sending my email first, but if it's urgent and you're not getting a response, you can try that. You can send me a message, a short message, like check your email or something. Um, here's the website I just showed you. Office hours. Oh, that should be updated. I so I've set office hours. Oh, I see. No, the office hours are under this heading. That should be eliminated. These are the office hours: Monday noon to 1 p.m. and Wednesday 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, you should have all got an invitation to both of those uh, recurring Zoom meetings. Um, and this is a link here to the Zoom meeting for the class. Um, you can see that this link includes the password, so anyone could link on it and get through, but you have to be coming from a UCSC domain or it's just, it won't let you connect. Um, so that's why I'm trying to prevent random people from joining us. Um, and um, so there will be live lectures at this um, Zoom link on the uh, uh, time that's scheduled for the course. If you uh, can't make those because your connection is bad or you just don't want to make it, <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely encourage people to attend, first of all, to attend lectures, period, or watch them or something, and second of all, to attend the live lectures if you can. But if you can't or don't want to, I'm going to record all the lectures and there will be links that will appear on the syllabus um, as those go up on YouTube. So, um, so like, uh, there'll be a link to this that will go up here. Um, and also, you could find it by going to my YouTube. Uh, account and finding the channel for this course. I'll put a link to that, I guess, on this syllabus and also on the main courses page. Um, so, I mean, those won't go up immediately. It takes, it can be a little bit time consuming to transcode the video and edit it if it has to be edited or whatever, but they'll, they should be up, you know, at least by the next day. Um, okay. Um, can't see the chat window right now. Again, oh, here we go. Uh, chat. Yeah. So, are there any questions about anything I said so far? Just like basic, how to get to the course, stuff like that. Okay, good. Um, so. Next, course description. I guess I'll probably, you know, I'll wait till my introduction to the course to talk about what the contents are going to be. Um, course requirements. So there's two assignments. For each one of them, you have a choice between a take home exam format, which is what most people choose, or um, a more free form paper format. Um, the the take home exam is right now. I see an inconsistency. I don't remember if the 
think there's an inconsistency between what it says here and what it says on the assignments in terms of how long the paper has to be. Um, I think I'm going to go with this. And that also probably means the take home exam instructions are, are wrong. I should say choose two questions instead of choose three questions. All right, so I will fix that on the assignments. But anyway, there's two, you have an option to do the take home exam. That means basically you just answer the questions I asked about the reading. Um, but you have a choice, and like I said, I think it says three, but I think you can change the two. You have a choice of, you know, two out of however many, six or something, different questions. Um, and that's, I think, relatively easier because you don't have to come up with your own question, which is basically what you do when you write a paper. And you don't have to write the introductory paragraph that explains why this is a good question. You know, you know it's a good question because it's on the exam. <laughs> so, um, so that's basically an easier option. The paper option is, is meant to be a little bit more difficult or challenging, but if, for example, you're thinking about going to philosophy grad school, you definitely might want to consider doing that because it's going to make it easier for me to write a recommendation about you later on if you write papers. Um, you know, plus you might want practice writing papers. Um, so that's why I have that option. Um, there, uh, whichever way you do it, it's due on Canvas by the assignments tool. Um, um, and there's just one assignment on Canvas, one midterm assignment, and one final assignment. I'll, you know, figure out from what you hand in which one you did. Um, and yeah, PDF or MS Word is fine or anything else that's easy for me to change to PDF is fine. Um, right, it says here, and I said also in the introductory email that I think everyone got, I'm having trouble with my outgoing email, but I think I sent that before that trouble started. Do people get an, in, an email from me? Someone want to say yes or no? Anyone? Yes, I did. Okay, good. All right. So, um, yeah, so as I said in that email, I'm saying it here on the syllabus as well. I understand positions are not ideal for everyone right now. Um, you know, uh, if you're having trouble making the due dates for the assignments uh, or Anything else, just let me know. Um, and uh, please bear with me as well because I'm not working under ideal conditions either. Uh oh, it looks like. Many can just quit. Quality should be better once I quit the browser. Once I finish going through the email. Okay. Um, all right. There you go. Sorry, right, bear with me. All this stuff worked last time I used it last year. <laughs> okay, I already talked about this. Um, these are the texts I ordered. Um, uh, 
hopefully everyone has been able to get a, either a physical copy of those or found a way to access them. Um, if you find a different edition, like these two at least are available in different editions, that's probably okay. Most of the reading assignments go by like chapter, section, stuff like that, rather than page number. So you should be able to find the reading assignments if you have a different edition. Um, and um, the readings that are not from those uh, texts that I ordered are available on Canvas. And there's links on the syllabus, or if you go to the Canvas page, for the course and look under files, readings, there's a, you know, they're all there. Um, okay, are there questions about any of that administrative stuff? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to say a little bit about what this course is about. So it's about philosophy of science. Um, hold on, which one's it? That's better. Um, and what is philosophy of science exactly? Um, well, first of all, uh, it's not, at least according to most of the people who have done it, it's not history or sociology of science. Um, right, so I mean, well, first of all, it's not science or at least not most kinds of science, it's not chemistry, it's not physics, right? It's some kind of philosophy. It's not history of science, right? So it's not the study of what scientists actually did or actually do. Um, and it's not sociology of science, so it's not in some other sense a study of what scientists do, right? Like how science is organized as an institution, something like that. Um, it's some kind of philosophical study of science. Um, now, uh, if we had a really good definition of what philosophy is, uh, that would help a lot. Of course, we don't have a really good definition of what philosophy is, <laughs> right? When I when I teach uh, Phil 11, which they haven't asked me to do for a while, maybe partly for this reason, <laughs> when I teach Phil 11, the first thing I usually say is something like, well, you might expect a course called Introduction to Philosophy. You might expect me to begin the course by telling you briefly what philosophy is, but actually that's one of the hardest questions in all of philosophy. <laughs> so, right. So, um, so I can't uh, explain what philosophy of science is by saying, well, you know what philosophy is. Well, this is philosophy, but it's about science. Um, but actually, from another angle, that sort of helps explain what philosophy of science is. Because um, uh, one question you might try to answer when you ask what philosophy is, is, is philosophy science? Oh, actually, I should stop the screen share. I want to the glass. Um, all right. Sorry. So when I wrote philosophy of science on the board, you couldn't see that. Remind me if that happens again. It's, it's easy for me not to realize what you're seeing. <laughs> um, 
Okay. Um, so is philosophy science or is science philosophy? Is one of them contained in the other? Well, um, so the um, ancient answer to this was yes. Um, both terminologically, right? So the word, the Greek word that we translate as science, episteme, also the same word we translate as knowledge, um, right? In Latin, scientia means both knowledge and science still, but we translate scientia in some contexts as knowledge and in others as science. Right, so anyway, the Greek word we translate as science is episteme. Um, so like uh, when Aristotle talks about physics, he calls it hephusike episteme, the physical science. <laughs> um, so, um, and uh, he wrote a book about that. <laughs> um, so it's part of um, it's one of the books he wrote, which are all about philosophy, right? So all the things he calls sciences are parts of philosophy. Now there's one he calls first philosophy that later people called metaphysics, which he considers to be philosophy or love of wisdom in a narrower sense, but in a broader sense, philosophy includes all of these things. So terminologically, Philosophy and science for Aristotle, uh, I mean, depending exactly how you use the terms, one might be included in the other or a type of the other, but they're basically names for the same thing. And also in terms of the things we still call science, such as the things he treats in the physics, um, which includes it, includes at least the, a lot of things we still treat in physics, like the way bodies move, right? uh, when they're pushed, when they're not pushed, how fast do they fall, et cetera, right? All that kind of stuff is considered in the physics. Um, and also the things that we study under the title of psychology and biology are introduced in the physics and then treated in more depth in some of his other books. Um, so basically the things we still call science are also parts of philosophy, according to Aristotle, and according to all the ancient um, and medieval writers for that matter. So, um, um, but nowadays, at least in English, we don't tend to call philosophy science. Right? Philosophy is not one of the sciences. Um, you make a distinction between philosophy and what we call science. Uh, in German until recently they would, I'm not sure right now what the status is, but certainly until recently they would have called philosophy Wissenschaft, one of the sciences but they still make the distinction that we make. They would talk about, you know, the uh, natural sciences, Naturwissenschaft, the human sciences, basically, that is humanities and social science, Geisteswissenschaft, and then philosophy doesn't really fall under either of those, right? So there's a distinction between what we call the sciences and philosophy, which is not part of um, when did that start? Um, well, uh, people started realizing that that had started, I think, in the course of the 18th century. Um, realizing more and more that there was a distinction that the things uh, that we call sciences were no longer part of philosophy. Um, there was a different method involved or something like that. 
Um, but I, love, I think people started really realizing that in the course of the 18th century, it, it happened earlier, right? It's already happening in Descartes and Leibniz. Um, you can see them starting to say things like, um, in order to study physics, you don't have to know anything about metaphysics or theology. Right, it's its own self-contained field, and in fact, maybe it's even harmful to bring in those topics there. Right, it should be based on, of course, the rationalists and the empiricists disagree on what it should be based on. <laughs> right, should it be all based on experience, or should it all be based on mathematics, essentially, geometry, and certain other fundamental a priori sciences, but they definitely, but they both agree it has its own support, its own way of doing things, and something that you that they agree you can see in Galileo and later in Newton that they're doing this, even though again Galileo and Newton don't necessarily realize this, especially Newton thinks that his work on physics is related to his work on angels and whatever else he's interested in. <laughs> um, but um, so sometime in that early modern period, it turned out that these things that traditionally philosophers were supposed to were regarded as part of their field. And by the way, I should say, Aristotle and following Aristotle, a lot of other people make room for the idea that there are specialists, right? That there's a person called the logician or the physicist or, um, who's different from the metaphysician or something like that. But um, that all turns out to be mostly an abstraction because it's mostly the exact same people who do all of them, <laughs> right? In other words, there's Aristotle when he's writing as a logician versus Aristotle when he's writing as a physicist, but it's the same Aristotle. And that same thing is true, again, throughout ancient and medieval philosophy, right? So there's these things that philosophers have continued, considered part of their competence. Now, all of a sudden, they're being done in a different way by a different type of person who's not interested in the type of questions about it that philosophers would ask. And what's worse, they're super successful, whereas the philosophers never really got anywhere. <laughs> right? I mean, the philosophers thought they were getting somewhere. Right? Like before Newton and Galileo, you could have thought Aristotelian physics um, was sort of satisfactory. You know, you could explain why heavy things fall down and light things go up. <laughs> um, uh, you could kind of explain why the planets go around the Earth in a circle, except, of course, the Ptolemaic model didn't have them going in a circle. Right? It turned out to be impossible to explain the motions of the planets that way, and instead they had to put these epicycles in them. Right, so I, I don't know how many people, how many of you already know this, but I'm just going to say briefly how it worked. Right, so this is the Earth. If you want to explain how, let's say, Mars moves in the sky, it's really hard to do by having Mars go around in a circle. Why? Because if you watch Mars in the sky night after night, you'll see that it goes in one direction for a while, and then it turns around and goes in another direction. This is what's called Mars being in retrograde you heard in astrology circles, and then it kind of turns out, goes back in the other direction. Why does that really happen? Because the Earth is going faster than Mars in its orbit, so at some point the Earth catches up with Mars and it starts to look like it's going back. <laughs> right? That is, in real life, the Earth and Mars are both going around the Sun, and the Earth catches up with Mars. Mars looks like it's going backwards for a while, and then when we get far enough away, we see it. Okay, but so in order to explain that, Ptolemy introduced these epicycles. So Mars goes in a little circle, and a little circle goes in a big circle. This is completely inconsistent with Aristotelian physics. 
there's no room for something in the spheres above the moon to move around a center other than the center of everything, which is the center of the Earth. And also, how can, this is supposed to be a solid sphere that Mars is attach, attached to. How is this other one turning? <laughs> right, it's impossible. So, but people said, well, you know, the Ptolemaic system is just a calculating mechanism. We know really somehow it's explained by these concentric spheres. So they felt like they were doing okay. But then along comes Newton. I mean, like first is Copernicus and Galileo and finally Newton, who's able to make these incredibly accurate predictions that Aristotelians just couldn't make. Um, and especially, I guess, I'm sure you've heard of this, like the crowning moment was when Haley predicted the return of a comet, right? So a comet is something that clearly doesn't move in a at a constant velocity in a circle around the center of the Earth. Aristotelians thought comets were phenomena in the air, right? Like some kind of luminous cloud that appeared in the atmosphere. Haley, based on the idea that the, a comet is moving in a highly elliptical orbit around the sun, was able to predict when the same comet would return seven years later. No one had ever predicted the appearance of a comet before. Right? As far as everyone knew, they were just random. So, as I said, not only is this not being done by philosophers, and not in the way philosophers would think you, should, you would have to do it, but the new way is incredibly successful, whereas philosophers were not. So this is a crisis, basically, for philosophy. Um, and I think from the beginning, there are kind of two approaches to it. Um, they're not exactly consistent with each other, but nevertheless, they, they sometimes come together in some kind of combination. And the first approach is, um, to say, well, um, philosophy, that is the part that philosophers are still doing, um, has to somehow emulate these new sciences. And then we'll be just successful the way they are. Right? So you get a whole succession of people saying this. Again, like before the distinction is even clearly made, you have people like Locke, well, Descartes, Locke, Spinoza saying, okay, I'm going to adopt the method of the new physical sciences in my philosophy. Um, they don't agree what the method of the new physical sciences is. Right? So, like, if you're an empiricist, you think now philosophy should, should adopt empirical methods, which is kind of what Locke tries to do, and especially it's what Hume announces he's going to do in the treatise. Um, if you're a rationalist, you think it means philosophy should imitate geometry and be based on the structure of Euclid's elements, which is what Spinoza tries to do. But it's two prongs of the same approach. Since the new physical sciences are so successful, we have to be like them. And people keep announcing that over and over. Kant announces that. Um, the people we're going to be reading announce that. People after them continue to announce that. <laughs> right? Um, it never exactly works, or at least in my judgment, it hasn't worked so far. But anyway, that's, that's one approach. The other approach, which I said is kind of strictly inconsistent with it, is to say, okay, these subjects have to be given up to this new thing, which is not philosophy that we're calling science. What is left that these new sciences can't take care of that philosophy still has to do with? And we may not be as successful as they are, but unfortunately, there's no other way to do it except the way philosophers do. Um, and uh, as I said, that's 
um, the reason I say it's not really consistent with the first strategy is because obviously if philosophy was going to be part of science now or like the physical sciences, then I mean, I guess it's not completely inconsistent. It's just there's some tension there. They, uh, I guess to make them consistent, you say something like, this is the new science that hasn't got on the sure footing yet. And that's going to be called metaphysics or first philosophy. So a number of people, including Descartes to begin with, try something like that. Um, again, they don't necessarily agree what that is. Again, they tr people try things like that over and over, and you'll see some of the authors we're reading still trying things like that. Um, so anyway, why am I going into all this history, aside from the fact that that's the way I approach everything? <laughs> um, you write these two strategies here. The first one is, Philosophy must be like science. And the second one is, what's left for philosophy? And um, the first one, I already alluded to this basically, requires philosophers to figure out um, okay, what is science? Why has modern science been so successful? It looks like I've frozen over here. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so that requires philosophy of science. Now, I mean, we're still not sure exactly what that is because we're in the process of figuring out what science is and what philosophy is, right? But it requires philosophers, right? We can say it requires philosophy of science in this sense. People who want to consider themselves philosophers had better look at science and see what's going on. What makes it so successful? Why were Galileo and Newton able to do these things that Aristotelian physicists were not able to do? Um, but the second strategy doesn't obviously require philosophy of science. I mean, you might be able to do it just by thinking about philosophy, but given the situation it's come up in, uh, it also tends to call for philosophy of science. Right, because so here we're going to ask, um, we're really interested in the question, what is philosophy? But part of the way we're answering the question, what is philosophy, is by trying to distinguish it from science. Right, to say philosophy is whatever it is, it's not science. So what is science? <laughs> right, so that leads back to that same question again. Philosophy of science trying to figure out what modern, especially modern natural science, um, as I'm sure you're aware, modern social science, psychology, it's not as clear that they've been so successful. I mean, it's not 100% clear about modern natural science either. Of course, there are people, including philosophers, who think that um, there's a bit of a hoax or a takeover there, right? That, that modern scientists are good because they've set the standards for what counts as good. <laughs> um, and um, one of the people reading, we're reading, Thomas Kuhn, has a version of that, right? So that's not a crazy view that can be completely ruled out. But in any case, assuming as seems to be the case, that uh, modern natural science in particular has been really successful. That's especially what we want to explain. So we want to explain, so it's, you know, presumably it's not just that these people were really lucky and happened to write, think the right thing. 
presumably they're doing something right. Right, so that's why a lot of the question ends up being about, oops. Scientific method. What is it that the scientists are doing that allows science to be very successful in some fairly obvious sense, but fairly obvious, but still like needing to be explained what that sense is. Um, so this is kind of like the deep background why there is such a thing as philosophy of science, right? Why there's a philosophical question, a specifically philosophical question about science. And I guess, you know, Part of the beginning answer, especially on this strategy, um, might be something like this. Um, when you studied Aristotelian physics, the first thing you would study is what is physics? Right? What is the science of physics? Um, that is, you studied the answer to the type of question that philosophers are asking about science and philosophy of science. What does a physicist do and why? What is physics? What is the object of physics? What is the aim of physics? All those things were, you know, that would be what you would, that would be what you would first study when you study the Aristotelian physics. When you study modern physics, you do not study that. The first thing you study is what is the definition of velocity or something like that, right? Um, you know, when I say you do not study this, of course, if a physics professor is giving, especially if they're giving a course to non-physics majors, but even in the introductory physics course for physics majors, they might say a few words about this, but it's not their professional specialty. And it's kind of hand -wavy, right? I mean, that's not something they ever would publish a paper about. What is physics, right? So, um, you know, uh, they might say a few things about it, but you shouldn't be surprised. In a sense, even they shouldn't be surprised if what they say about it is not that. Uh, doesn't hold up to a lot of examination. So, I mean, you know, from the point of view of philosophers, you almost want to say modern physicists don't know what they're doing. They're leading the unexamined life. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. Um, to which the physicist could very correctly reply, okay, you predict the return of Hayward's comet, right? <laughs> I mean, obviously we know what we're doing. <laughs> Just not the way philosophers do. All right, so I mean, that's at least some kind of hint to what I think about these questions. Um, it's not exactly what most of the authors we read are going to say about it, but it's, it's something like that is going to keep coming up, and especially in theme, something like that is going to come up. Okay, so anyway, that's like the general background. Um, do people have questions about that so far? You can ask in the chat or unmute yourself. I do hope people will ask questions, especially in this remote learning um, environment. It's really hard for me to tell. I can see a couple people who happen to be at the top of the screen and happen to have their video on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't look out at the class and see if people are smiling or frowning or checking their phone or whatever. <laughs> um, so if, you know, if what I said didn't make sense, or if it's interesting and you want to ask something else about it or anything, please don't hesitate. 
Um, okay, but if there are no questions, I will go on to the next thing, which is, you know, there's a couple more things I wanted to talk about. So the next thing is, all right, so this, in this sense, philosophy of science is pe something people have been doing since Descartes, at least, whether they know it or not. Um, but this course is not going to start with Descartes. <laughs> Um, so, um, why am I, this, this course is basically, um, mid to late-ish 20th century material, um, and it's, um, the earlier stuff we're going to be reading was written in German, and the later stuff was written in English. Um, so why, why did I choose these readings and why did I organize the class the way I did? Well, um, so first of all, if you haven't already heard about this in some philosophy course or other, I have to introduce this distinction between analytic and continental philosophy. I have to introduce it. I can't say nearly enough to make sense of what it is. Um, I've actually spent some time trying to figure out what it is myself, but, um, but I'll just say, like, if you hadn't heard about this before, that um, nowadays and since at least, well, let's say post-World War II, approximately, um, philosophy, by which I mean like the institution of philosophy, academic philosophy, has been mostly split into these two large schools or styles that we call analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. You can tell even from this terminology that something weird has happened, right? This is the name apparently of some kind of method, like analysis. Whereas this is name of a place, continental Europe. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, um, what this this is not a distinction between like people in this school believe X and people in the other school believe Y. It's either more or less than that. Somehow, it's like a distinction between how philosophy looks when you write it. Um, uh, what philosophy's attitude towards its own history is, like in what way philosophy appropriates or uses its history and which part of its history. Um, uh, and also, most relevantly for us, it's a distinction in the way philosophers, for the most part, think about their relationship towards mathematics, modern mathematical logic, and science, especially physical science, right? Analytic philosophy historically, and this is still largely true, has thought of itself as in some kind of vaguely defined positive relationship to science. We want to be like science, we want to be part of science, um, we want to use scientific tools, or at least mathematical or mathematical logical tools. Um, whereas continental philosophy um, has uh, um, Again, it's, it's vague and hard to define, but at least hasn't had that strong positive relationship to natural science, mathematical logic, and mathematics. Um, I mean, I'm trying to define, I'm defining this in terms of the attitudes that people, for the most part, with exceptions, definitely have had, because, I mean, neither of these are actually very much like science or mathematics. Um, right, this is a story, and if you've heard from me in another course before, I apologize because it's one of my favorite stories, but I once asked a mathematician friend of mine whether anyone ever publishes 
a mathematics paper to just to point out a problem in someone else's proof. And he said, well, no, I mean, if you find a problem in the proof, you contact the editors of the journal, and they contact the author, and the author either fixes the proof or issues a retraction. <laughs> now, I, I don't know how many of you have read philosophy journals, but basically, uh, I would say like three quarters of the papers in philosophy journals are part of an ongoing debate about whether there's a certain problem with a certain proof or not. Right, like not, it's not just the first one where, I, where someone says, hey, you published this paper, you claim to prove X and I found a problem. It's like the fifth go around where they're defending themselves or someone's defending them against the attack, against the, right. So, I mean, so like all the efforts of analytic philosophy to be like science or mathematics or whatever have definitely not succeeded. <laughs> if that was the aim. It's, sometimes it's the aim and sometimes it isn't. But anyway, so it's not that analytic philosophy is a lot like science or that analytic philosophers on the whole understand science better than continental philosophers. I think there are some who do. People who work on what's called philosophy of physics tend to know their physics really well. Um, but on the whole, a lot of analytic philosophy has been and even continues to be written on the assumption that 17th century mechanistic physics is basically correct, right? Like as if there hasn't even been Newton, let alone quantum mechanics, I'm not kidding. Right, meaning that people think of causation as a bunch of bodies that move each other by pushing. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, that's like as big a scientific error as what you typically see in continental philosophy. But the attitude difference is important. Uh, so, I mean, and it's, uh, I think, partly for that reason that the discipline we call philosophy of science emerged as a branch of analytic philosophy. Sorry, we have a street <laughs> cleaner going by right now. Um, okay, so, um, so uh, and as I said, this split, even though people sometimes project it way back and say, well, Hume was kind of an analytic philosopher, Hegel was kind of a continental philosopher, or whatever. That's anachronistic or mythological, right? It's like people appropriating pieces of history for, the, for themselves. This, like I said, this split actually, I mean, it starts off sometime in the 30s. It, it doesn't become really, people don't really realize that it's happened until sometime in the 40s. So, and, uh, but anyway, so, what we call philosophy of science, there are continental philosophers who write about science, but the, the discipline that we call philosophy of science is a branch of analytic philosophy. And what um, I've assigned in this course are basically uh, what I take to be the fundamental texts of that discipline, meaning historically fundamental, like how did it start out? Um, and um, there's two basic traditions to this, as I understand it. Um, that is, to the early parts of analytic philosophy of science, there's two main traditions. They both start off associated with, here, let me erase a lot of this, you know, what's called the Vienna Circle. <laughs> Um, right, so the Vienna Circle was a bunch of philosophers who kind of hung out with each other in Vienna in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, uh, the founder of it was someone named Moritz Flick. I mean, it was, when I say the founder, it was somewhat formal. They had, you know, like a 
reading group that would meet, and at some point they even had a manifesto. <laughs> um, so it was founded by this fellow, Maury Schlick, but probably the most important, uh, at least in the first generation, were um, two people we're going to be reading um, uh, quite a bit by, Rudolf Carnap and Otto Neurath. Um, and these people, plus some others, founded a school called Logical Positivism, which dominated analytic philosophy um, from that time in the 30s when they founded it until like around the beginning of the 50s or so. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about what Logical Positivism is because you're going to know more than you want to know about that after you read Carnap's uh, works. <laughs> I mean, those the works I've given I've assigned. But uh, they were the they were the founding members of logical positivism. Then there were other generations after them. Um, um, but also associated with the Vienna Circle, although not exactly a full member of it, because for one thing, he wasn't in Vienna, he was in Berlin, was uh, Karl Popper. So he was not exactly a member of the Logical Positivists. We'll see, actually, one paper assigned by Norrat is essentially a denunciation of Popper saying, don't be fooled, he might look like one of us, but he isn't. <laughs> um, so he wasn't exactly a member of the Vienna Circle, but he was associated with them. He wasn't exactly a logical positivist, but he had certain things in common with them. Um, and um, basically out of these two, came the two traditions that I'm talking about. And uh, so you'll see if you look on the readings on the syllabus that the course is divided into two parts. And the first part starts with Carnap and then goes forward up to um, um, well, basically up to Quine, although there's some later people mixed in the middle. Um, and uh, then the second part goes back, starts with Popper, and then goes forward to some later people and ends with Kuhn. So, um, so those are the two. So, uh, at least my claim is my story in the course is that there were two traditions here, and they gave two different answers to the main question about. What is it that makes modern science especially rational and therefore especially successful? That is, it started with two different answers to that, one by Carnap and the other by Popper. And then as you go along, you find people attacking and revising those answers. Obviously, this is an oversimplification. <laughs> I shouldn't even have to tell you that. Uh, a lot more happened than just this. I mean, also what I said about analytic and continental philosophy is an oversimplification. There's been other people who couldn't be classified under either of those, um, like certain Wittgensteinians, uh, Cavellians, Straussians, whatever. But, you know, so, so this is a little bit of a cartoon version of history, but I think it's, it's close enough that I've organized the class around. Um, and, um, These two different answers are not too different. They both stress the importance of empiricism. Um, but, but, but what makes science so successful is its use of empirical testing. And again, now, so now by science we mean modern physical science, especially, or modern natural science. Um, its use of empirical testing, and um, 
they both, uh, although perhaps for slightly different reasons, or they give slightly different justifications for it, they both like to use modern mathematical logic to explain what they're talking about a lot. <laughs> um, so um, that is, you know, basically what we teach in Phil 9. Um, they don't use it in a really deep way, right? They're not proving interesting theorems about mathematical logic or something like that. They mostly are taking advantage of the symbolism. Carnap, in some of his later works, moves into more like innovation in the field of mathematical logic. But even so, I don't think that work um, is mathematically very deep. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's that they're interested in the way of talking about things that mathematical logic affords. They're not so interested in it as a mathematical subject matter in its own right. So what that means is that, you know, if you basically get the type of stuff we teach in Phil 9, it shouldn't be hard to get through the, the formulas that they use. Um, and, and it's not important to understand every detail of them when they're wrong. <laughs> uh, you know, if you basically don't get that stuff, it's going to be a little bit harder. But um, I think, although they believe it's essential, it's mostly not essential to understand what they're doing. So I'm going to try to make the course as easy as possible for people who have trouble with those formulas, but I can't assign readings that don't have them because that's what they want. <laughs> All right, so um, those are all things they have in common. So what's the difference between them? So um, basically, Carnap, so let me actually erase Moirat and just leave Carnap up here. Um, Science uses empirically meaningful terms, empirically meaningful language. Um, um, and he goes through various, the, the initial version of this is what he develops in his book that most people, including me, call the Aufbau because of its German title, the Logische Aufbau der Welt. Uh, but I mean, the translation calls it the logical construction of the world. Um, right, so, but I'm still, I'm gonna call it the Aufbau. So the, the initial version of this is the Aufbau, then as problems develop, he introduces other versions of it. But basically the thought is this, that modern science starts off in the right way because modern scientists give an empirical meaning to their terminology meaning that somehow or other um, there's um, empirical criteria for whether a certain kind of thing that I'm talking about is there or not. Um, and, uh, um, and because modern sciences uses empirically meaningful terms, the statements modern scientists make are in principle justifiable by empirical methods. That is, if I want to know if what someone said is true or not, I consult the empirical criteria for the terms that they've used and the combination they've used to them. Oh, sorry. Does Carnap complain about Heidegger in any of the readings? Um, no, uh, unfortunately, that's. Don't think he mentions it by name in the Alpha. That would be a whole different course. I've written a paper about Carnap and Heidegger. <laughs> uh, published a paper about Carnap and Heidegger. I'd love to talk about it, but it's not really a subject for this course. Um, yeah, uh, but I mean, when Carnap does complain about Heidegger, he uses this tool to, or he complains about it in these terms. It's just, like, if you understand, as I think Carnap actually did, what Heidegger thinks about language, then you, it turns out that the critique is much more subtle than you might realize. 
But all right, so leave hi to go aside, however. So, so the point is, you know, if I say, if a scientist says, Bailey's Comet will return at such and such a time, or water boils at such and such pressure, at such and such temperature, or whatever, that in principle, I can um, consult the empirical criteria for the parts of that statement they've made, and um, put them together in such a way that I end up with an empirical task of testing whether they are right or not. Now, I mean, um, that task, although maybe in principle, it even could be done in a finite amount of time. That's what Carnap thinks early on. In practice, it normally can't be done, right? Like there would be too many, like, you know, there is, if I said water boils in such and such a temperature and such and such a pressure, the task would involve somehow boiling all water everywhere and seeing at what temperature it boiled at that pressure, right? So I'm never going to finish that. Or, I mean, if not that, it would reduce to some other infinite or very long task like that. Yes, uh, the method of verification, although, I mean, the method of verification is usually used for an extreme version about that. I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to it. I'm just, I'm talking about it more abstractly now because there's certain things that remain constant even as Carnap changes his views about what verification is and so forth, right? So what remains constant, I think, is that the way scientists talk somehow gives an empirical task to signs an empirical task to each one of those state, their statements by which even if you can't settle whether it's true or not, you can gather evidence for or against it. Right? So the statement is empirically justifiable. Therefore, its statements are empirically justifiable. is empirically <laughs> empirically justifiable that's the Carnap side and so the reaction against Carnap is going to be like does you know can you really make oh sorry and I should have there's one thing I left out as opposed to what he calls metaphysics which uses terms for which there are no empirical criteria in principle. That's not just we don't know exactly what they are, but they, in principle, they don't have empirical criteria. And therefore, when a metaphysician says something like the world is composed of an infinite number of monads or whatever, um, there is no empirical task of figuring out whether it's true. You can't gather any evidence for or against it. And therefore, Carnap says, and again, this is something he continues to say in one way or another as he goes along, although it becomes more complicated. Therefore, what the metaphysician says, strictly speaking, is meaningless. It's nonsense. Okay, so that's Carnap's view, and the responses to it are going to be about whether it's possible to do this with the terms that are actually used in science, whether it's possible to draw that line that he wants to between science and metaphysics, um, things along those lines. Um, as opposed to Hopper, whose answer is that Science makes empirically falsifiable statements. The statements, or I guess more correctly, from Carnap's point of view, uh, from Popper's point of view, the theories, the theories are collections of statements. The statements or theories that scientists assert are always such that some evidence could come along that would rule them out. 
I mean, presumably they're not such that some evidence has already ruled them out or else there would, <laughs> would be a bad theory, right? But some evidence could come along that would rule them out. And that's, that means that they're false. That's what he means by saying they're falsifiable, empirically falsifiable. And therefore, Popper says, even though scientific statements are not justifiable by empirical evidence. Right, this is one of the hardest things to understand about Popper or most surprising things to understand about Popper. And obviously we'll have to, I mean, he talks about it, we'll talk about it when we get to Popper. But he says, no empirical observation proves that a scientific theory is true or even makes it more probable. I mean, the first part is relatively easy to accept. Yeah, I understand. No observation proves for sure that my empirical theory is true. But Popper says it's not just that, because Carnap agrees with that. It's that um, it doesn't even make it more probable. So science is not collecting evidence for um, in favor of its theories. Rather, scientists are looking for falsifications of theories. The only kind of evidence there can be is evidence against a theory, and it has to be decisive. It falsifies the theory. That's what we're looking for. So where did the theories come from in the first place? Again, there's some complication to that, but the basic answer is we guess. <laughs> Oh, someone said um, my paper came up first in Google was it? No, I don't think it's because you go to UCC. I think it's because there's not very many papers about that. And they do know you go to UCSC. Then. Well, and that's not creepy, right? I mean, all our email, everything is through Google. Of course they know. Anyway, sorry, getting back to this, right? So, um, so according to this, we understand why science is rational because science is going around trying to justify its, its theories by empirical means. Why does Popper think science is rational? We just have this theory that we guessed is true. How is that rational? He says, what's, there is no way of, just, of justifying universal theories by particular evidence. It's logically impossible, he says. So what is rationality? in the empirical domain, rationality is not being dogmatic, meaning that when you guess something is true, you open yourself to refutation by the evidence. That's what makes science rational. And that somehow has to explain, again, why science is so successful. Right, so that may be a sticking point. I mean, a lot of people think that's a sticking point for Popper, and we wanted to see what Popper's response to that is. Um, all right, so that's the second tradition, and responses to this are going to be questions about um, are scientific theories really falsifiable? By the way, I should say one more thing here. Therefore, Popper does not claim that everything that's not science is nonsense. On the contrary, he says metaphysics is perfectly good and useful for its own purposes. Um, but it's just not science. There is something that's not science that he hates. Though. He doesn't think it's nonsense, but he thinks it's bad. Because, I guess, it pretends to be science when it isn't, and that's what he calls pseudoscience. Right, so the difference between science and pseudoscience is going to be that pseudoscientific theories look like scientific theories, but they're not falsifiable. Right, so responses to this again are going to be like, is it true that scientific theories are falsifiable by the evidence? Um, is it true that that's enough to explain why science is rational and successful? Um, is it true that you can make a distinction between science and pseudoscience that way? Or is any way you try to get it, you try to do it, going to include some pseudoscience or exclude some science after all? Um, 
And also, I guess, just um, more broadly, I mean, but more importantly, maybe, and this is the level that Kuhn attacks it on, is it true that scientists are trying to find reputations for their theory? Are they acting the way someone would act if they were looking for reputation for their theory? Um, okay. So, um, there are some other things I wrote down here in my notes. So I, so I can, I guess I'm going to skip some of these, but I'm not going to skip what I should say, which is some introductory things about the output. Are there questions, are there more questions about this before I go on? Where I erase it. Actually, I mean, there is one thing I really should mention. In terms of those two strategies I said at the beginning, let me write kind of and proper up here again, just so I can point to them. So Carnap says that everything that isn't empirically meaningful is nonsense. Well, someone just asked, I've heard Popper had issues with psychoanalysis and Marxism. Um, yes, so it's because, and by the way, when he says Marxism, he means later Marxism. I think that's not often emphasized. He doesn't necessarily think that this is an objection to Marx himself, but he thinks that psycho psychoanalysis, in, that, in this case, beginning with Freud himself, I mean, Freud was still alive when he was writing, um, but psychoanalysis and later Marxists both have adopted a strategy of unfalsifiability, right? So that if you say, like, well, I think Freud, your theory is wrong because X, Y, and Z, they'll say, ah, see, that's a sign that you're resistant. <laughs> right? um, you know, um, and in the case of Marxism, they see, well, you know, okay, so Marx predicted that there would be a proletarian revolution soon in one of the most advanced uh, capitalist economies. There was no proletarian revolution anywhere. There was a Marxist revolution in Russia much later which was still in the feudal state from the Marx, right? So, uh, so Popper says, how did Marxists react to this? Did they say, oh, I guess Marx was wrong? No, they said, oh, but, <laughs> blah, 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 and therefore Marx is still right. This is Popper's understanding of what happened. Obviously, uh, later Marxists would tell a different story about what happened, but, um, uh, right, so that's why, and, and um, yeah, again, because they look like science, they look like they're making empirical statements about the world. Um, they demand to be treated in our practical deliberations the way science would, something like that. Again, it's not, Popper says a lot more about the distinction between science and pseudoscience than he says about the distinction between pseudoscience and other things that are not science like mathematics, metaphysics, um, or methodology of science, what he's doing, or um, um, engineering. Also is one of the things that Popper is trying to, or no, sorry, that's not true, that's more cool. Popper actually includes engineering in science. But, all right, so, but anyway, those other things, mathematics, metaphysics, why are those not pseudoscience? I don't know that he explains any of that. But yeah, so psychoanalysis and later Marxism are his main examples of pseudoscience. Um, I think he would agree that the things that we usually call pseudoscience these days, like you know, uh, astrology or anti-vaxology or whatever it's called, or you know, things like that. I think he would agree that those can fit in his category of pseudoscience, but it's not actually the main type of example. He's thinking. I mean, I guess, you know, like, you definitely could see how it worked in the case of astrology, 
if the astrologer does all the charts and figures out where all the planets were when you were born and so forth and comes out with a whole set of predictions and they don't come true does the astrologer say oh i guess my astrological theory was false no they're like well there's interfering influences you know whatever right um uh or the prediction is vague enough that you can't tell whether it came out right or not or you know something like that um i'm not sure how that well that would apply to some of the other things people call pseudoscience like climate phenomena Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so, but what I wanted to say, I already kind of said part of it. So according to Carnap, everything that isn't empirically meaningful is nonsense. So what is philosophy then? It can't have its own subject matter outside of empirical science, right? So like the answer to what is left for philosophy is in a sense nothing. Um, but he doesn't, unlike, as we'll see, Quine tries to do, he doesn't go ahead and say, oh, philosophy is just part of science, right? I mean, then philosophy studying science would be history and sociology of science, right? Or biology of scientific brains or something like that, right? He says, no, there is something left for philosophy, only it isn't the content. He says philosophy is um, the mathematical study of the language of science something like that. And the way he understands that, it turns out not to have, not to make, to make statements that are in a sense meaningless just because they're tautological, right? That is, they're logically valid, something like that. So there is something left for science, for philosophy to do, and it is basically philosophy of science. <laughs> All philosophy is, in some sense, philosophy of science, according to Carnap's understanding. According to Carnap's understanding of what science is and what philosophy is, Popper, on the other hand, doesn't have to say anything like that, and he doesn't, right? Because he does allow that there's perfectly meaningful things you can talk about that just aren't scientific. And he, as we'll see, comes right out and says, "I'm not a naturalist." I don't believe that philosophy itself is well described by what I'm saying about science. And that includes what I myself am doing, right? So he says, what I do in my book is not science and you shouldn't expect it to be falsifiable. Why is it still a good idea to do it? I mean, he'll have something to say about that, right? Um, uh, so there, that is, so for Popper, there is some content left over for philosophy, and that's what philosophy does. Um, um, and therefore also, it's not true that all philosophy is philosophy of science. Um, although philosophy of science is important, because science is important. <laughs> okay, I said I wouldn't go the whole time, but it looks like I might, but all right, or almost. All right. Um, okay. Right. So I'm just going to say a tiny bit about Carnap and about the alpha. Uh, Carnap, uh, his years are 1891 to 1970. Um, he was born in Germany. Um, uh, and um, uh, got his education in Germany. And, uh, but when he started teaching, he moved first to Austria and then to Prague. Uh, does Carnap make ethical statements are meaningless? or can ethics somehow be empirically verified? The answer is, is very interesting. Namely, at the time of the outbound, he thinks ethics can somehow be empirically verified. But not long after, he decides that ethics is meaningless. That's not to say that ethical statements don't have their use, but their use isn't to convey a meaning. So we, we will get to it. Um, 
anyway, um, all right. So, um, yeah, so, but when uh, he got a job um, uh, teaching, he um, um, ended up in Vienna and then in Prague. Um, you know, was it the other way around? I think it was Prague and then Vienna, actually. Um, but uh, uh, when the Nazis came to power, most of these people were left wing politically. Kranab was a socialist, Neurath was a, a Marxist. You kind of gather why he didn't get a line out well with Popper. <laughs> uh, Popper was less left wing than the rest of them, but he was still a liberal Democrat. Um, all of these people had to leave Germany and Austria, wherever they were, uh, when the Nazis came to power. So Carnap ended up uh, moving, I guess he was actually at Harvard for a year, like they found a way for him to come there first, then he was at the University of Chicago for a while, and then he ended up at UCLA. He spent the last part of his career at UCLA. Um, but the Aufbau is his earliest major work. He did write some things, publish some things before the Aufbau that are interesting. Um, but it's his first major work and the first work that's clearly a work of logical positivism. Um, and it was published in 1928. He started writing it before he even arrived in Vienna, but uh, he like, presented an early version of it to the Vienna Circle. So they all they had some part in criticizing it and transforming it into what was eventually published. Um, and um, I'm not going to say anything about what it's about because you can, I've already said I think enough to give a vague idea of what it's about, and hopefully you can get from Kayak himself. Uh, more in more detail what he's doing. Um, this is the only translation of it still, I think. It's not completely ideal translation in some respects. Uh, the biggest problem is the translation of this German word Constitution as Instruction. Right, so in the title, they translated Aufbau as construction. But throughout the book, um, it's this word Constitution that's translated as construction. Um, there's no good reason to do that. There is a German word, Konstruktion, and Carnap uses it. And he doesn't use it to mean the same thing as Konstitution. So uh, why, did, why the translator did this, Rolf George, I guess his name is, um, I, I think this was actually a decision that was made by Quine and Carnap, and they told him to do it. And I'm a little, the reason why they did it is complicated, probably, probably to, partly to hide Carnap's ties to Husserl and Kant. Um, but uh, it's kind of bad, but it probably won't be that important for our purposes because we're not really looking backwards, we're looking forwards to the people who receive Carnap. Um, and uh, what else should I say about it? Not everything in this book is straightforwardly about philosophy of science, even though, like I said, in a sense for Carnap, everything is philosophy of science. But certainly, like everything, everyone, including Popper, says about philosophy of science, has they always have in mind things that Carnap said in the Aufbau, so it's all good foundation for philosophy of science. Um, and a lot of it is explicitly about science. Um, it is probably the most difficult reading, um, maybe by a lot that we're going to have. So I'm sorry, sorry we're starting out with the most difficult reading, but at least you can look forward to other ones that won't be as difficult. Um, um, 
Okay, I think that's everything I want to say for now. Are there more questions? Um, okay, well, in that case, I will see you on Tuesday. Bye.